So let's take a look at hard disks. But before doing that, you might wonder why care about hard disks anyway? Because in many systems today, all of the data fits into main memory anyhow. So why would we worry about hard disks? Well, there are many reasons for that. And the first is the industry is kind of slow moving. This means major database products out there are still disk based. So this includes IBM, DB2, but also Oracle. Yeah, they have products that were originally designed for a disk based system. They are now integrating more and more main memory technology or even dedicated main memory database products. But their flagship products were originally designed having a disk based system in mind. And for that reason, you still find many hard disk systems in use in industry, in research, in practice. And whenever there's a performance problem with one of those systems, it's very useful to know what are the performance characteristics of a hard disk and what might be a problem in a specific installation. Therefore, it is still important to know about hard disks. Another reason is that every database needs durability or persistence, as you might phrase it. So maybe you remember the asset properties from the introductory lectures. This D means durability. So if you keep all your data in main memory and then the electricity is failing or switched off, all the data is lost. So you have to have a separate medium to persist the data. And that's usually a hard disk. The hard disk is sometimes replaced by flash storage these days. And in the near future, it will be replaced by persistible RAM. But as of 2013, it's still the hard disk in many, many situations. And another reason is that there are very large data sets out there. So especially Google, Yahoo, but also in natural sciences, a lot of data is being collected and that data simply doesn't fit into the main memories. So you have to keep it on disk. Those are the reasons why we are looking at hard disks here. So how does a hard disk look like in principle? You have a number of platters. So those are the platters that are connected to a spindle and all of that is rotating. Those platters are magnetic, of course, and then you can write to those platters and read from those platters. This is done by the different disk heads. So they sit on one arm and this arm can move all the disk heads simultaneously. So you can't position the disk heads individually. If you move that arm, all of the disk heads will move. Once you move the arm to a specific position, you can use one of the heads at a time. You can't use all of the heads simultaneously. You might think it should be able to operate all of the heads simultaneously and read or write in parallel to the different platters, but that doesn't work. The reason for that is that there's some fine tuning, some fine positioning involved for each track. So if a track here on one platter is at that position, it may be a slightly different position on another platter, even though it's logically the same track. So for that reason, one head may operate at the same time. So we have the platter, we have the spindle, we have the arm. We have the different disc heads, so one for each side of the platter. And then there are these virtual tracks. They are defined by the position of the arm. And, um, and all the positions you can reach by rotating the platter once. And there's another important term here that's a cylinder. So a cylinder is a set of similar tracks for all platters. And why similar? As I just explained, yeah, so the tracks might be on slightly different positions on the different platters. But logically, they're all called the same cylinder. So here in this graphic, all of those tracks here belong to the same cylinder. That's the basic idea of a hard disk. And of course, those platters are rotating. They're rotating pretty quickly, something in between 5,000 to 15,000 rotations every minute. Okay, when you look at the hard disk, there's one term that frequently pops up, and that's the term sector. Unfortunately, it's used in two different ways. If you think about a sector, you might recall something from mathematics that is the angle. So the circular sector is the angle and that's like defining a piece of that entire pie here, so to say. So it's all of this area 
is defined by one specific angle. In contrast, if I talk about a sector in the following, I mean something different. For me, a hard disk sector is usually 4K, 4 kilobytes of data. And that's not the same thing as a circular sector, obviously. Here the sector is one chunk of data. One of these green things here is a block, 4 kilobytes of data. However, the circular sector is this angle defined on the left here. So that's a different thing. If I say sector, I mean the HD sector in the following. In very old hard disks, the number of blocks on each of those tracks was the same. It didn't matter whether you were on a track very close to the center of a platter, or whether you were close to the edge. You stored the same number of blocks. If you did that, you would have a block here, would be of that length, and the same block would be of this length here. So the data here would require much more space than it would take here. And therefore, at some point, people switch to a different design that's called zoning or zone bit recording, which means closer to the edge of the device, you can store more blocks. So here, for example, within the same mathematical angle, you can store five sectors on each track, one, two, three, four, five. But if you get closer to the center of the platter, you can only store four and so forth. So you closer you get to the center, the smaller the number of blocks you can store. All adjacent tracks that contain the same number of blocks are called a zone. So the property of this zone here is that all tracks here have the same number of blocks. Yeah, very important to keep in mind is if, as you have more of those HD sectors of those blocks close to the outer edge of the platter, the transfer rate is higher. Yeah? The, the rotational speed will stay the same at all times. Within one rotation, whether you're here, you will read less blocks than when you're here, as there are more blocks or more sectors, more HD sectors on these outer zones. It's very important to understand. Sometimes this is exploited in benchmarks. So if people want to make sure they get the best performance, they get many, many hard drives and only place data on the outer edges of the platter because then you get the highest performance. So a hard disk sector, that's a unit for read and write access on that device. It's a fixed size subunit of a track. Typically it's half a kilobyte to four kilobytes, so it got bigger over time. Nowadays it's four kilobytes. It also stores self-correcting error codes, so the hard disk is able to detect if some bits were flipped on the magnetic device. As with all devices, there may be errors, and then it's important to detect whether such an error occurred. There are two things that are important here, of course. The first is detecting the error. Detect the error. And the second is recover the data. Recover the data. So assume you wrote a block, let's say you wrote a block, this is our block, you wrote it to the device, you wrote it to the hard disk, and then you read it, and the hard disk tells you, well, there was an error. So that's nice, because then you know you're not working with wrong, with erroneous data, but still, how do you get back to the original data? That's an important thing here. That may depend on the situation. We will look at that in more detail later on. It's important to have that in mind. So some methods allow you to detect the error. Some methods also allow you to recover the data, even though there was an error. So once we found out that there's a difference of circular sectors and hard disk sectors, there's another confusion, and that is hard disk sectors versus operating system blocks. So a hard disk sector is something like four kilobytes, as explained above. So sometimes it's very confusing when people talk about an operating system block. So the operating system as well has this concept of a block, but that may mean something different. So for instance, the operating system may use eight kilobyte blocks. So what we have is something like this. We have this eight kilobyte block and it consists of two hard disk blocks, say hard disk block one and hard disk block two, but all of that is one block on the operating system. Let's say it's block 
A on the operating system. So be careful not to confuse those two concepts. So how do we address data on the hard disk? Well, originally one could address the different sectors physically and that was called physical CHS addressing, where CHS means cylinder, head and sector. So with three numbers you could identify any sector on that device. So for example, if you had 1024 cylinders, 16 heads and 256 sectors per track, then you could identify each sector with that number. That was used for old devices. But then eventually vendors started to mimic those addresses, providing logical addresses. That was called logical CHS addressing, meaning so you had a logical CHS number, but then the controller mapped that to a physical CHS number. So as an example, to the outside, to the interface, it looked as if you had 1024 cylinders, 16 heads, 256 sectors. This was not what was happening internally. Internally, the device used something different, maybe only 512 cylinders, only 12 heads, but 256 sectors. So even though it appeared to you as if this was the physical design of that device, internally, this was used. So what you used to address data on the device was mapped to something very different. And that was already one abstraction where some control was lost over the device. There's always a balance in computer systems. The more control you have, the better you are able to control performance. Here you had less control as there was a mapping in between those two worlds. And there was even less control, there was even more abstraction with a third addressing scheme that's now widely used. That's logical block addressing or LBA. What that means is now, so if you address any sector on the hard disk, now this sector is only addressed with a logical block number. That is a number from zero to N. Huh? Zero to N. And the, the controller, the hard disk controller, that's a small computer that sits on the hard disk, maps that to the physical cylinder head sector addresses. And how that is mapped is beyond your control, so you don't know how that is mapped. That's kind of a problem for performance optimizations. So if you have a logical block number of zero, this might be mapped to something like this. If it's one, it might be mapped to something like that and so forth. But we don't have real control over that mapping. So basically what this implements is a low-level file system. We usually make the assumption that proximity on those numbers here on the left is related to proximity on the right. So we hope that if two logical block, block numbers are close to each other, the physical positions of their sectors on the device are also close to each other. This doesn't have to be like that, but often that is the case. So you see already that there's a mapping going on. You don't have direct access to the sectors. So what might happen is that one of the blocks is erroneous. Blo logical block numbering here might start with that. So assume it's 42, this is 42, then this um, block that is failing is 43, and then it's 44, and then it's 45, and so forth. So 42, 43, 44, 45, and that would be 46. And you might assume that all of those blocks are adjacent on disk. But in this situation where one of the, those blocks is failing in the sense you write some data to the block, you read it again, and it's different, the hard disk controller might decide to map it to a different position. So it might flag this block as failing and then replace it with a different block. If this is block number 43, the hard disk controller might map it to this physical position, which means when you sequentially read over this data, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, you might assume that you're doing a sequential read, but actually at this point in time, the mapping would lead you to this position. So you would have to do a disk arm movement to get to that position. Then you go back to continue reading over that track. This is a very useful feature offered by hard disks. So you don't have to manage the blocks that are failing. 
On the other hand, it might impact the performance of the hard disk if there are too many of those blocks. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, Jens Dit, or you look at our website, infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you then.